I'm Lisa de Nicolitz, and I would like to read to you from my fourth novel, The Witch Doctor's Bones. Canadian Living Magazine has said of The Witch Doctor's Bones, a journey that seeds with peril, stripped of the niceties and rigours of polite society. So here we go, from The Witch Doctor's Bones. There was a moment, shortly after she left the restaurant, that Kate was delighted to be alone. The cool night was refreshing and she savoured the ocean-scented air, glad to be on her way back to the lodge, and it was only after she turned off the main street that she began to feel uneasy. She quickly dismissed her fears as a reaction to the silence around her after the noise of the restaurant. Nevertheless, she walked faster, pulling her sweater tightly around her. She strained to hear if there were any other footsteps, and while she couldn't hear anything, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong. Her heart began to pound, and she told herself not to panic, not to run. The wide street leading down to the lodge was devoid of movement, except for the flitting shadows of the tall palm trees that swayed in the breeze, and the only sounds were the rustle of the leaves and the clacking of a tin can as the wind kicked it down the hill. The amber pub windows glowed but gave no comfort, and the locked-up houses were dark and tucked far away behind wrought iron fences. Kate tasted fear, bit her lip and stared straight ahead. She told herself to stop scaring herself with foolish thoughts. She told herself she was frightening herself for no good reason. But just as she was convinced there was nothing lurking in the shadows and that it was all in her imagination, a boy of about 18 stepped directly in front of her. Kate gave a quick harsh grunt of fear and the sound held in her throat. She knew from what Helen and Marika had told her that these boys had nothing to lose. He could kill her for 20 rand and feel nothing for it. Madam must not be afraid, the boy said, talking softly with his hands in the pockets of his cheap tan jacket. I am Doomy from the market. Do you remember me? You did not buy anything, and you said you would come back later, and I waited, but you did not return. That is not polite, madam. He looked at her, his eyes small and a narrow face, his lips thin, his chin sharp and pointed. Kate did remember him. When she stopped to look back at Helen, Doomy had thrust a carved wooden bowl at her, shouting, and she didn't recall saying anything to him. She only remembered her fear and that she had wanted to be as far away from him as possible, far away from the market as possible. I'm sorry, Doomy, she said, stepping around him and walking fast. I, I didn't buy anything from anyone today, but I'm going to come back and buy tomorrow. Remind me, she said conversationally, what did you have at your store? The boy was lanky and his trousers were too short, and a length of grey sock showed, and his shoes were that of a businessman, only cracked and old. Madam, I had the bowls and the big spoons, and you liked the bowl with the lions drinking at the edge. Do you remember? He kept his hands in his pockets and matched her stride for stride. I do, she said, but do you have any other kinds? Yes, madam, I have ivory bowls and the green soapstone ones. Hmm. I would worry that the soapstone one would be too heavy for me to carry all the way back home. She wanted to keep him talking. How much was the ivory bowl? It was 300 rand, madam. Ah, Kate saw the lodge come into view. Well, Doomy, that's a lot of money. Now tell me, what's the best price you can give me? Because I can't pay 300. What is madam's best price, he asked. You tell me and we'll negotiate. Let me think. She picked up her pace. How about 200? Oh no, madam, that's much too low. 270. 250? 250 is the lowest I can go, madam. But what is that in US dollars? Kate wished the lodge would miraculously come up towards her. Well, divide it by seven, so just over $30. Well, that is a good price, Kate agreed, quickening her pace even more. The side door to the lodge pub was open, and a wonderful warm light spilled out, and with it, the noise of people laughing and talking. Kate had made sure she was on Doomy's right, and she was ready for this moment, and she dived through the door and quickly ran into the milling crowd, who were drinking tequila shots from a wall-mounted Springbuck's rear end and licking salt off its balls. Kate, leaning against the bar counter, was never more delighted to watch inane drunken activities in her life. While outside, 
Dumi was furious. Madam, he cried repeatedly into the crowd. Madam, until one of the local men shouted at him to stop. Hey, you boy, footsack, how many times must we tell you not to hassle the tourists? Do you want to go to jail? Is that what you want? I recognize you, boy. Now get lost or I'll come out there and help you. Dumi shot off into the night, and the, the man turned to Kate, but she had left. Her heart still racing, she practically ran to the room, scrambling to find the key and locking herself inside. She made sure that the windows were locked and she closed the curtains. She checked the washrooms, the one with the broken shower, and the one with the broken toilet. Area secured, she said out loud, sinking down against the frame of the bunk bed, and sitting among the comforting holiday mess, she began to feel better. That was so stupid, she took deep breaths. I could have ended up with statistics. I'll never be careless like that again. First thing I'm going to do tomorrow is buy something to protect myself. I won't be caught off guard like that again. She saw Marika's bottle of old brown sherry sticking out of a bag, and she helped herself to a few generous swigs to help calm her nerves. And then she had a long shower. Her heart was still beating fast. So that's a reading from The Witch Doctor's Bones, which I hope you enjoyed. The Witch Doctor's Bones is available online and in bookstores. Thank you very much.